right now we're losing farms. Yeah. And we're losing farm acreage. Yes. So uh, how do we expect farmers to continue? And how do we attract the next generation of farmers? Well, it's a really tough question to me because there are really literally, literally thousands of young folks right now who are saying they're getting a degree in college and they're saying, I want to do something with my hands. I want to feel like I'm part of the food system. I want to feel like I'm part of the answer for helping the planet. And so many people, so many good folks with lots of energy really saying, I would like to do this, but I can't quite figure out how. And what they mostly rely on is they get to know someone who owns land and they start working as an intern or they start helping them, this person, the old landowner, build a farm or they rent a little bit of acreage and they start getting to know their market and start developing a way of producing food. And some of those folks are just producing an incredible amount of food on, the, on the, just the, the, the skin of their, their, their knuckles, you know. But um, the problem is really that the price of land is set more by what investors need for land and what subdivision developers want to pay for land and what um, the market will bear, which is way above the cost of what you can raise by farming. And it's very hard for a young person starting out of college with no assets to really start making a payment on a land that's going to get them very far, on land that will get them very far towards owning a farm. And that's one of the, the dilemmas of the system we have, this industrial farm system, that it, makes, it raises the prices so high that the system can't sustain itself. And there's no way to pass that land on to the... You can pass on the land to your grandchildren, but you can't sell it to somebody who's young because they can't afford to buy it. And um, we have to develop some approaches. And I think it really, again, com really comes down to young folks developing a trust relationship with someone who owns land. And it also depends on us setting aside some land so young folks can find a way that's affordable. One town in Iowa that I've heard about has actually decided to donate 200 acres of ground because they're losing population. And they said, we will donate this land to young people who want to start to farm if they'll come here and if they'll promise to buy, uh, build a house and start an agricultural operation that's organic. And we want a cluster of farms on that, on that 200 acres. We don't want one single farm. We want a group of families to be there. But we'll give them land if they'll start producing something valuable for our food economy. And it's that kind of creativity that helps you cut through those crazy economics. Oh, that's, I, I love the idea of that kind of partnership with the, with the community, because farmers don't have to be alone in facing these kinds of issues. Share with me your story of Black Hawk County, Iowa, and the difference maybe one city councilman made. Well, yeah, Black Hawk, Iowa is a really very interesting reason. There's a county in Iowa, north central Iowa, called Black Hawk. And, uh, they've had for about 10 years a Buy Fresh, Buy Local campaign, which is a, a national effort to really help locales like this develop trading relationships between local consumers and local farmers. And there's a man at the University of Northern Iowa named Kamyar and Cheyenne, who is a city council member for the city of Cedar Falls. He's now uh, the director of the Center for Energy and Environmental Education at the University of Northern Iowa. And he's been the leader of the Buy Fresh, Buy Local effort in this region. He started out in 1998. There was one restaurant, the university, and a hospital that had already started buying food from local farmers because they thought that was a good thing to do. And those three places were selling about $110,000 worth of products. Kamiar basically sat people down together and said to a farmer, wouldn't you like to sell food to someone you know? And he went to the hospitals and said, wouldn't you like to buy food from someone nearby instead of buying it off a distant commodity stream? And Kamyar's charisma is good enough and his, his grace is so good that he really built a lot of trust where, where people realized that was a smart thing to do and they trusted the, his connections and his ability to kind of negotiate that. So now after 10 years of doing that, the Black, Hall, Black Hawk region of Iowa is trading $2.2 .2 million of local food simply because one man started making connections and saying to people, wouldn't this be a good thing to do? Wow. So how do we start these kinds of conversations between urban and rural? They're happening all over the United States right now, but they're not largely in the media. They're very, very small scale. and A lot of people think they're too small to be worthy of outside attention. But uh, I'm working with 37 regions around the United States today 
where I've done a study of the local food economy. I help people with trying to figure out how do you move this question the way Kamyar did. Whatever the conditions for a certain region might be, it's going to be different in every place. There's no one model you can use that's going to work for everybody. But it, people really are standing up, and we've had Michael, Ball, Mike, you had Michael Pollan on the show recently, and his book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, I think thousands of study groups have formed all over the country where people are reading the book and talking about it together. And they're cooking each other good meals and saying, how do we get better food, and how do we have more fun and more kind of connection around what we eat? It's an amazing movement, and I've been working with movements all of my life, and this is one of the most robust ones I've ever been part of.